we'll start now. Well, good morning, everybody, from ADD 125, a spring session. Um, this is the first of our attempt to put video teaching online for you to uh, hook up to. I'm not quite sure how we're going to do this after I'm finished with this session because this is the first one, but we're going to try to YouTube it and then send you a link or actually post it on Canvas for TMCC. So bear with us on this. Of course, you know who I am and um, that's fine. You have my email address in the synopsis or the syllabus and you should have my phone number as well. If you have any comments, great, we'll go from there. So let's start with uh, chapter seven. Before spring break, we were talking about um, roofing and roofing types. And that's what chapter seven starts off with. But then it breaks into something that I feel is very important for our class to understand. And we're gonna be talking about that all day today and perhaps in the next uh, video session as well. And it deals with managing water and the effects of water on our buildings. As I said before, 80% uh, of all of litigation and damages to buildings comes from water claims, mostly for roofs. And that affects our interior environments greatly. So the whole reason why we build structures is for protection from the elements. And that includes the envelope systems, our walls and our roofs and our floors, to be uh, designed properly to prevent moisture damage. Can you hear me okay? Good. Um, so let's, the first thing we're going to talk about is flashing. We started to talk about that before we left for spring break, but flashing is probably the most critical uh, aspect of preventing water intrusions into our walls and our roofs, and even our floors for that matter. Um, critical. So that's the first line of defense from water intrusion. Now, let's bear with me a little bit. I'm getting used to this. There's two types of flashing. There's passive and there's active. Now, passive flashing is when something actually has something uh, 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 an element built into it that prevents the flow of water from going back through a, uh, a system. A good example of this is uh, a wood siding, something that may look like this. And we call that a tongue and groove joint. And we can put that on our wood siding. What happens here is that when water comes down the side, it has to go through this, this groove uh, to get to the other side, which isn't going to happen. When we slip these two pieces together, it's just going to continue on down. So that's a built-in form of flashing that directs the water away from a joint between materials. The other side is active. Now, active flashing is something that actually works in and of itself between materials. Many times we'll see flashing like this between panels of plywood that are installed horizontally. That flashing will be here like that. over a panel. So that's active. And we use this type of flashing in our roofs, as we've talked about before. When we have roof systems that come down, we put a piece of flashing on it like that. That's an active piece of flashing. This type of flashing is the most common. Having said that, uh, let's talk about the different types of flashing we have. What 
I've just shown you here is a uh, you know, metal flashing. Okay. So, active flashing is not just metal. We can use a product that's a rubberized flexible flashing, such as this. This is a rubberized asphalt, rubberized uh, adhesive. When you take this off, back side is dry, front side has adhesive on it. And when you add it to something, it becomes waterproof and it sticks. I put it on pretty lightly. This stuff is pretty tenacious. But this is what we can use to wrap windows with and uh, roof, rooftops around valley gutters, um, all sorts of penetrations through, through our, our roof, roof assemblies and penetrations through our wall assemblies. So this is a pretty important part of the, uh, the systems to prevent water intrusion into our, into our building Structures. Okay. Anytime we have a penetration through a wall or a roof, there's going to be a gap between the materials itself, like a pipe, and the roof materials on the roof, or a wall, like a window or a door. There's going to be gaps, and those are all those gaps are places where water can go. And that's where flashing has to come in. If there's one part of a structure that's left open for water intrusion, you can guarantee it that water will find its way through there and cause a lot of problems. So, whenever we're detailing our building, our structures, we need to pay attention whenever there are penetrations through our walls, our floors, and our roofs, because that's where the water is going to come from. If we can do that and keep the water away, we have tackled most of the problems with water intrusion in our structures. So to recap, there's different types of flashing materials. There's bent metal shapes, there's rubberized asphalt. Sometimes we use sheets. Uh, this uh, brown paper that we use uh, underneath our siding is a form of flashing because it directs moisture away from our buildings. And that's a fabric. And sometimes we use what's called an elastomeric sealant. It's like a caulk. And we will put that between materials to keep water out from joints, especially in places like masonry or uh, floor joints and bathrooms and things like that. There is one thing, though, that I need to discuss with you that's not in the book. Electrolysis. Electrolysis is a condition when two different metals come in contact with each other and there's water present. I once had a well on a house I lived in north of Reno and we put a brass coupling on a steel pipe and several years later uh, that, that, that joint in, in the ground to my pump for my well sprung a leak and what had happened is that the brass fitting began to deteriorate because the iron oxides in the steel corroded it that's called electrolysis the electronic the electric electrons in the in the material itself transferred to the other material and they were not compatible so that's why it's important when we use metal flashing We have to use same to same materials. If we're using metal, bent metal, then that has to go on, on, on metal siding. If we're using aluminum, like aluminum windows, then we have to flash that. We have to use aluminum flashing. 
And that's why something like this material does come in handy because it's inert. It doesn't have metal on it. And we see a lot of this stuff going on metal trims and flashings on our roofs. So be aware of electrolysis. Okay, we talked about the importance of flashing, but what makes flashing work is a sequence. And we talked about that sometime in the past as well. Remember we talked about roofing? Water goes downhill, flashing has to go uphill in a reverse direction. That's sequence. So it's important if we have a piece of flashing that goes underneath something and we have to flash it some more, we always flash it so the water is not going to be able to go through it. That doesn't work. This works. What that means is you have to do the bottom part of the flashing first and then put something over the top of it. You'd be surprised how many times I've seen this reversed, just innocently without uh, the draftsman knowing about it or the, even the contractor following up on it. That is the way to do it. Always think of the sequence and how we put things together, not just for wall panels and insulation and things like that, but for flashing because that's where the trouble starts. The flashing part you'll find on 17 point, on chapter 7.18 and 19, and it's a pretty good sequence in there to explain what's going on with flashing. And we use flashing everywhere. We use it on our foundations. We, we use it in our walls. We use it in our roofs. We use it between walls and roofs and walls and foundations. If you look at the details and the illustrations on 718 and 719, you'll see how that takes place, especially with roofs. One, uh, here's another example of micro flashing. How many of you have seen, um, I probably haven't seen too much of this, but if we have a metal roof, We want to put it onto a substrate. That's called an exposed fastener. And those exposed fasteners usually have a rubber washer on it. So when you put a nail down or a screw down and you tighten it, this washer compresses and seals up the hole that the screw makes. Okay? That's fine and dandy. But we also have to realize that metal will expand and contract over time. And as it does that, it makes the screw hole bigger. And also at the same time, the weather will deteriorate these neoprene washers, these rubber washers. And after 10 years, that washer's gone, and the hole with the nail or the screw is twice the size of the shaft of the screw, and that's where water comes through. Okay, that's fine. That's a small point of entry. But when you have a whole roof full of these things every 10 inches, there's thousands of these penetrations on a roof that are undergoing the same deterioration, and that roof will catastrophically fail and leak water uh, in, in the near future. That's something you need to avoid. That's something you have to be aware of. Now, if this is a roof that you're using for a cattle barn, great. But if you're going to put it over a house, beware. Now, how do we, how do we mitigate that? We we'll use a concealed fastener. Oh, 
had more board space. Hmm. Next time we do it, we're going to do the whole garage tour. Okay, concealed fastener. We're going to put little clips on our roof, like this. Now once we have this fastener in place, now we can bring a roof system over here like this, over the top of this, and hook it to that. That is a concealed fastener. It also it's a hold down. It holds this thing down on the roof so the wind doesn't blow it off. But it all has to do with this turn down right here to make that work. So this is usually a part of another piece of metal that will come up here and do the same thing. So they all clips together. That will work. Also, a detail like this allows the metal to expand and contract on its own without affecting the fastener. So the metal itself on the roof is unaffected by the stationary aspect of the clip that holds it to the roof deck. Cool. Yeah. Who would have thought about that 200 years ago? Now we're going to segue into something else. Uh, sure get this right. In section 7.23, you're going to get introduced to um, pressure equalization. In your book is a good explanation of that. It's not just about flashing, but it's about how, how water works and how air, air pressure works. You should read that to understand it better. Um, let's see that or not. Pressure equalization, <coughs> excuse me, will come into play when we want to um, neutralize pressure from one side of a wall or one side of a roof to the other side of the roof. That's why we have gaps sometimes, uh, air gaps. And I'm going to get into this pressure equalization that's in 7.23 a little bit later on in our lecture when we start talking about ventilation and moisture control. So bear with me on that, but I do want you to read that section on 7.23. It's a good introduction to the concept, just as brief as it is. It's all part of what we need to notice in the book. Then from there on, it goes into um, uh, masonry and cavity walls and things like that. We're not going to get into it in that much detail. Let's move on. When we have to deal with uh, materials that expand and contract, we have to pay attention to the effect that that has on how moisture gets into our buildings. We just talked about how metal will expand and contract with heat or cold, and how we have to uh, uh, work with flashing that differential movement and prevent water from taking advantage of that change in material sizes and shapes. Other materials work the same way. We use what we call relief joints, where we put joints in walls. Um, and that's also a form of flashing. Everyone's probably familiar with stucco. Whether it be a wall material, a panel, there will be a slip sheet like black paper or 15-pound um, felt, and then there will be a stucco, a compound put on in different layers. At some point in time, that stucco, because it's water-based, is going to shrink. 
So we need to put some type of a joint in here that will allow it to compress and shrink as well. And sometimes that joint just looks like that. Kind of like the tongue and groove joint we talked about with wood, only this is an active flashing because it's a separate element. And we'll do that. And sometimes you'll actually see materials that look like this. Which allows these materials to expand and contract and still be waterproof because the flashing goes up the wall to prevent water mitigation coming through here. If in fact we did something like this and curtailed it, we could actually put the sealant joint right in there too. That's where the elastic and the sealants come in. Back to flashing, important. Um, Let's take a break for a minute.